Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today, we are reading Shadow Over In's Mouth by H.P. Lovecraft. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 1 During the winter of 1927 to 1928, Officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of this in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting, under suitable precautions, of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in the spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definite charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular gals of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons, but nothing positive ever developed. Inn's mouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organizations were met with long confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end, only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched, since the low, black reef lies a full mile and a half away from Innsmouth Harbor. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outside world. They had talked about dying and half deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little. For wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbors off of Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last, I'm going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain are so thorough that a public harm, save a shock of repulsion, could ever accrue from a hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of a whole tale has even been told to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper. For my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain, but now that it is an old story, with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those frightful hours 
in that ill-rumored and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. I never heard of Inn's mouth until the day before I saw it for the first and, so far, last time. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was traveling by train, trolley, and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, and it was only at the station ticket office when I demurred at the high fare that I learned about Innsmouth, the stout, shrewd-faced agent whose speech showed him to be no local man, seemed sympathetic towards my efforts at economy, and he made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. You could take that old bus, I suppose, he said with a certain hesitation, but it ain't thought much of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, and so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth fellow, Joe Sargent, but never gets any custom from here, or Arkham either, I guess. Wonder it keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it. Nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, front of Hammond's drugstore, at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m., unless they've changed lately. Looks like a terrible rattle trap. I've never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of Shadowed Inn's Mouth. Any reference to a town not shown on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbors, I thought, must at least be rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there, and so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Innsmouth. Well, it's a strange kind of town. It's down at the mouth of the Manuext. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812 but all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now. B and M never went through. And the branch line from Rowley was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess. And no business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly here in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left now except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing, and old man Marsh, who owns it, must be richer in Croesus. Strange old duck, though, and sticks mighty close in his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight grandson of Captain Obed Marsh, who founded the business. His mother seems to have been some kind of foreigner, they say a South Sea Islander. So everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl fifty years ago. They always do that about Innsmouth people, and folks here and hereabouts always try to cover up any Innsmouth blood they have in them. But Marsh's children and grandchildren look just like everyone else's so far as I can see. I've had him pointed out to me here, though, come to think of it. 
The elder children don't seem to be around lately. Never saw the old man. And why is everybody so down on Innsmouth? Well, young fellow, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. They're hard to get started. But once they do get started, they never let up. They've been telling me things about Innsmouth, whispering them mostly, for the last hundred years, I guess. And I gather they're more scared than anything else. Some of the stories would make you laugh. About old Captain Marsh driving bargains with the devil and bringing imps out of hell to live in his mouth. Or about some kind of devil worship and awful sacrifices in some places near the wharves that people stumbled on around 1845. But I come from Panton, Vermont, and that kind of story don't go down with me. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old-timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time, and never much below it. But at that, you can hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on the reef, sprawled about, or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. It's a rugged, uneven thing, a good bit over a mile out. And toward the end of shipping days, sailors used to make big detours just to avoid it. That is, sailors that don't hail from Innsmouth. One of the things they had against old Captain Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night when the tide was right. Maybe he did. For I dare say the rock formation was interesting. And it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot and maybe finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. The fact is, I guess on the whole, it was really the captain that gave the bad reputation to the reef. That was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth were carried off. They never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China, or somewhere by the shipping. It surely was bad enough. There were riots over it, and all sorts of ghastly doings that I don't believe ever got outside of town, and it left the place in awful shape never came back. There can't be more than three or four hundred people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply racial prejudice. And I don't say I'm blaming those who hold it. I hate those Innsmouth folks myself. And I wouldn't care to go to their town. I suppose you know, though I can see you're a Westerner by your talk. Well, there must be something like that back of the Innsmouth people. The place was always badly cut off from the rest of the country by marshes and creeks. And we can't be sure about the ins and outs of the matter. But it's pretty clear that old Captain Marsh must have brought home some odd specimens when he had all three of his ships in commission back in the 20s and 30s. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sergeant if you take his bus. Starry eyes that never seem to shut. Skin isn't quite right, rough and scabby. The sides of their necks are all shriveled or creased up. It bald, too, very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is... I don't believe I've ever seen an old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Nobody around here, or in Arkham or Ipswich, will have anything to do with them. And they act kind of offish themselves when they come to town, or when anyone tries to fish on their grounds. Strange how fish are always thick off Innsmouth Harbor when it ain't anywhere else around. But just try to fish there yourself and see how the folks chase you off. 
Those people used to come here on the railroad, walking and taking the train at Rally after the branch was dropped. But now, they use the bus. Yes, there's a hotel in Innsmouth called the Gilman House. But I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay over here and take the 10 o'clock bus tomorrow morning. Then you can get an evening bus there for Arkham at 8 o'clock. There was a factory inspector who stopped the Gilman a couple of years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems they get a strange crowd there, for this fellow heard voices in other rooms, though most of them were empty, and they gave him the shivers. It was a different language, he thought, but he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural, sloping-like, he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep. He just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fellow, Casey his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmouth folks watched him and seemed kind of on guard. He found the Marsh Refinery a strange place. It's an old mill on the lower falls of the Manuet. What he said tallied up with what I'd heard. Looks in bad shape, and no clear account of any kind of dealings. You know, it's always been a mystery where the marshes get the gold they refine. They've never seemed to do much buying into that line, but years ago, they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. And there used to be talk of a strange kind of jewelry that the sailors and refinery men sometimes sold on the sly, or that was seen once or twice on some of the marsh womenfolk. People thought maybe old Captain Obed traded for it in some port, especially since he was always ordering stacks of glass beads and trinkets, such as seafaring men used to trade in the native lands. Others thought, and still think, that he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. But here's the funny thing. The old captain's been dead these 60 years, and there ain't been a good-sized ship out of that place since the Civil War. But just the same, the marshes still keep on buying a few of those native trades, mostly glass and rubber, they tell me. But that plague of 46 must have taken off the best blood in the place. Anyway, they're a doubtful lot now, and the marshes and the rich folk are as bad as any. As I told you, there probably ain't more than 400 people in the whole town, in spite of all the streets they say there are. Although they're lawless and sly, and full of secret doings, they get a lot of fish and lobsters and do exporting by truck. Strange how the fish swarm right there and nowhere else. No one can keep track of these people, and state school officials and census men have a devil of a time. You can bet that prying strangers aren't welcome around in Smouth. I've heard personally of more than one business or government man that's disappeared there, and there's loose talk of one who went crazy and is out at Danvers now. They must have fixed up some awful scare for that fellow. That's why I wouldn't go at night if I was you. I've never been there, and have no wish to go. But I guess a daytime trip couldn't hurt you, even though the people hereabouts will advise you not to make it. If you're just sightseeing and looking for old time stuff, Innsmouth ought to be quite a place for you. And so, I spent part of that evening at the Newburyport Library, looking up data about Innsmouth. When I tried to question the people in the shops, the lunchroom, the garages, and the fire station, I had found them even harder to get started than the ticket agent had predicted, and I realized that I could not spare the time to overcome their first instinctive reticentness. They had a kind of obscure suspiciousness, as if there were something amiss with anyone too much interested in Innsmouth. At the YMCA, 
where I was stopping. The clerk merely discouraged my going to a such dismal, decadent place, and the people in the library showed much the same attitude. Clearly, in the eyes of the educated, Inn's mouth was merely an exaggerated case of civic degeneration. The Essex County histories on the library shelves had very little to say, except that the town was founded in 1643 noted for shipbuilding before the revolution, a seat of great marine prosperity in the early 19th century, and later, a minor factory center using the Manuext as power. The epidemic and riots of 1846 were very sparsely treated, as if they formed a discredit to the county. References to decline were few, Though the significance of the later record was unmistakable. After the Civil War, all industrial life was confined to the Marsh Refining Company, and the marketing of gold ingots formed the only remaining bit of major commerce aside from the eternal fishing. That fishing paid less and less as the price of the commodity fell, and large-scale corporations offered competition but there was never a dearth of fish around Inns Mouth Harbor. Foreigners seldom settled there, and there was some discreetly veiled evidence that a number of people who had tried it had been scattered in a peculiarly drastic fashion. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to the strange jewelry vaguely associated with Inns Mouth. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of specimens in the Museum of Miskatonic University at Arkham, and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society. The fragmentary descriptions of these things were bald and prosaic, but they hinted to me an undercurrent of persistent strangeness. Something about them seemed so odd and provocative that I could not put them out of my mind, and, despite the relative lateness of the hour, I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, strange proportion thing, evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby and after a brief explanation, that ancient gentlewoman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building, since the hour was not outrageously late. The collection was a notable one indeed, but in my present mood, I had eyes for nothing but the bizarre object which glistened in a corner cupboard under the electric lights. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty, to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy. It rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now, I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front, and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outlines. The material seemed to me predominantly gold, though a weird, lighter lustrousness into that some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect, and one could have spent hours in studying the striking and puzzlingly untraditional designs some simply geometrical, and some plainly marine, chased or molded in high relief on its surface, yet a craftsmanship of incredible skill and grace. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me, and in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element, hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first, I decided that it was the strange, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. 
All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. It clearly belonged to some subtle technique of infinite maturity and perfection, yet that technique was utterly remote from any eastern or western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard or seen exemplified. It was as if the worksmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half Patrakian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history as related by Miss Tilton. It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum at a shop in State Street in 1873. It was a drunken Innsmouth man, shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labeled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton, comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate horde discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. This view was surely not weakened by the insistent offers of purchase at a high price, which the Marshes began to make as soon as they knew of its presence, and which they repeated to this day, despite the Society's unvarying determination not to sell. As the good lady showed me out of the building, she made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude towards shadowed Innsmouth, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale, and she assured me that the rumors of devil worship were partly justified by a particular secret cult which had gained force there and engulfed all of the orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before, at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on the new church green. All this, to the pious Miss Tilton, formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation. But to me, it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away. Chapter Two Shortly before ten the next morning, I stood with one small valise in front of Hammond's drugstore, 
in Old Market Square, waiting for the Innsmouth bus. As the hour for its arrival drew near, I noticed a general drift of the loungers to other places up the street, or to the ideal lunch across the square. Evidently, the ticket agent had not exaggerated the dislike which local people bore towards Innsmouth and its denizens. In a few moments, a small motor coach of extreme decrepitude and dirty gray color rattled down State Street, made a turn, and drew up at the curb beside me. I felt immediately that it was the right one, a guess which the half-illegible sign on the windshield, Markham Minsmouth, Newburyport, soon verified. There were only three passengers, dark, unkempt men of sullen visage and somewhat youthful cast. And when the vehicle stopped, they clumsily shambled out and began walking up State Street in a silent, almost furtive fashion. The driver also alighted, and I watched him as he went into the drugstore to make some purchase. This, I reflected, must be the Joe Sergeant mentioned by the ticket agent. And even before I noticed any details, there spread over me a wave of spontaneous aversion, which could be neither checked nor explained. It suddenly struck me as very natural that the local people should not wish to ride on a bus owned and driven by this man, or to visit any oftener than possible the habitat of such a man and his kinsfolk. When the driver came out of the store, I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil impression. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes and wearing a frayed gray golf cap. His age was perhaps 35, but the odd, deep creases in the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that never seemed to wink, a flat nose, a receding forehead and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse poured grayish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches, and in places the surface seemed strangely irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual grayish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure, and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked towards the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait, and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied him, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit his feet. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks, and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. Just what foreign blood was in him, I could not even guess. His oddities certainly did not look Asiatic. Polynesian, Levantine, yet I could see why the people found him strange-looking. I myself would have thought of biological degeneration rather than heritage. I was sorry when I saw that there would be no other passengers on the bus. Somehow, I did not like the idea of riding alone with this driver, but as leaving time obviously approached, I conquered my qualms and followed the man aboard, extending him a dollar bill and murmuring the single word, Innsmouth. He looked curiously at me for a second as he returned forty cents change without speaking. I took a seat far behind him. 
but on the same side of the bus, since I wished to watch the shore during the journey. At length, the decrepit vehicle started with a jerk and rattled noisily past the old brick buildings of State Street amidst a cloud of vapor from the exhaust. Glancing at the people on the sidewalks, I thought I detected in them a curious wish to avoid looking at the bus, or at least, a wish to avoid seeming to look at it. Then we turned to the left into High Street, where the going was smoother, lying by stately old mansions of the early Republic and still older colonial farmhouses, passing the Lower Green and Parker River, and finally emerging into a long, monotonous stretch of open shore country. The day was warm and sunny, but the landscape of sand, sedge grass, and stunted shrubbery became more and more desolate as we proceeded. Out the window, I could see the blue water and the sandy line of Plum Island, and we presently drew very near the beach as our narrow road veered off from the main highway to Rally and Ipswich. There were no visible houses, and I could tell by the state of the road that traffic was very light hereabouts. The small, weather-worn telephone poles carried only two wires. Now and then we crossed crude wooden bridges over tidal creeks. These wound far inland and promoted the general isolation of the region. Once in a while, I noticed dead stumps and crumbling foundation walls above the drifting sand, and recalled the old tradition quoted in one of the histories I had read, that this was once a fertile and thickly settled countryside. The change, it was said, came simultaneously with the Innsmouth epidemic of 1846, and was thought by simple folk to have a dark connection with hidden forces of evil. Actually, it was caused by the unwise cutting of woodlands near the shore, which robbed the soil of its best protection and opened the way for waves of windblown sand. At last, we lost sight of Plum Island and saw the vast expanse of the open Atlantic on our left. Our narrow course began to climb steeply, and I felt a singular sense of disquiet in looking at the lonely crest ahead where the rutted roadway met the sky. It was as if the bus were about to keep on its ascent, leaving the sane earth altogether and merging with the unknown arcana of upper air and cryptical sky. The smell of the sea took on ominous implications, and the silent driver's bent, rigid back and narrow head became more and more hateful. As I looked at him, I saw that the back of his head was almost as hairless as his face, having only a few straggling yellow strands upon a gray, scabrous surface. Then we reached the crest and beheld the outspread valley beyond, where the Manuext joins the sea just north of the long line of cliffs that culminate in Kingsport Head and veer off toward Cape Anne. On the far, misty horizon, I could just make out the dizzy profile of the head, topped by the strange ancient house of which so many legends are told. But for the moment, all my attention was captured by the nearer panorama just below me. I had, I realized, come face to face with rumored, shadowed Innsmouth. It was a town of wide extent and dense construction, yet one with a portentous dearth of visible eye. From the tangle of chimney pots, scarcely a wisp of smoke came, and the tree tall steeples loomed stark and unpainted against the seaward horizon. One of them was crumbling down at the top, and in that and another, there were only black, gaping holes where clock dials should have been. The vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peak gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay. 
and as we approached along the now descending road, I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. There were some large, square, Georgian houses too, with hipped roofs, cupolas, and railed widow's walks. These were mostly well back from the water, and one or two seemed to be in moderately sound condition. Stretching inland from among them I saw the rusted, grass-grown line of the abandoned railway, with leaning telegraph poles now devoid of wires, and the half-obscured lines of the old carriage roads to Rally and Ipswich. The decay was worst close to the waterfront, though in its very midst I can spy the white belfry on a fairly well-preserved brick structure which looked like a small factory. The harbor, long clogged with sand, was enclosed by an ancient stone breakwater on which I could begin to discern the minute forms of a few seated fishermen, and at whose end or what looked like the foundations of a bygone lighthouse. A sandy tongue had formed inside this barrier, and upon it I saw a few decrepit cabins, moored dories, and scattered lobster pots. The only deep water seemed to be where the river poured out past the belfry structure and turned southward to join the ocean at the breakwater's end. Here and there, the ruins of wharfs jutted out from the shore to end in indeterminate rottenness, those farthest south seeming the most decayed. And far out at sea, despite a high tide, I glimpsed a long, black line, scarcely rising above the water, and carrying a suggestion of odd, latent malignancy. This, I knew must be Devil Reef. As I looked, a subtle, curious sense of beckoning seemed superadded to the grim repulsion, and oddly enough, I found this overtone more disturbing than the primary impression. We met no one on the road, but presently began to pass deserted farms in varying stages of ruin. Then I noticed a few inhabited houses with rags stuffed in the broken windows, and shells and dead fish lying about the littered yards. Once or twice, I saw listless-looking people working in barren gardens or digging clams on the fishy-smelling beach below. Groups of dirty children played around weed-grown doorsteps. Somehow these people seemed more disquieting than the dismal buildings. For almost every one had certain peculiarities of face and emotions, which I instinctively disliked without being able to define or comprehend them. For a second, I thought this typical physique suggested some picture I had seen, perhaps in a book, under circumstances of particular horror or melancholy. But this pseudo-recollection passed very quickly. As the bus reached a lower level, I began to catch the steady note of a waterfall through the unnatural stillness. The leaning, unpainted houses grew thicker, lined both sides of the road, and displayed more urban tendencies than those that we were leaving behind. The panorama ahead had contracted to a street scene and in spots I could see where a cobblestone pavement and stretches of brick sidewalk had formerly existed. All the houses were apparently deserted, and there were occasional gaps where tumble-down chimneys and cedar walls told of buildings that had collapsed. Pervading everything was the most nauseous, fishy odor imaginable. Soon, Cross streets and junctions began to appear, those on the left, leading to shoreward realms of unpaved squalor and decay, while those on the right showed vistas of departed grandeur. So far I had seen no people in the town, but there now came signs of a sparse habitation, 
curtained windows here and there, and an occasional battered motor car at the curb. Pavement and sidewalks were increasingly well defined, and though most of the houses were quite old, wood and brick structures of the early 19th century, they were obviously kept fit for habitation. As an amateur antiquarian, I almost lost my olfactory disgust, and my feeling of menace and repulsion amidst this rich, unaltered survival from the past. But I was not to reach my destination without one very strong impression of poignantly disagreeable quality. The bus had come to a sort of open concourse or radial point, with churches on two sides, and the bedraggled remains of a circular green in the center. I was looking at a large, pillared hall on the right-hand junction ahead. The structure's once white paint was now gray and peeling, and the black and gold sign on the pediment was so faded that I could only make out with difficulty the words, Esoteric Order of Dagon. This, then was the former Masonic Hall, now given over to a degraded cult. As I strained to decipher this inscription, my notice was distracted by the raucous tones of a cackled bell across the street, and I quickly turned to look out the window on my side of the coach. The sound came from a squat, towered stone church of manifestly later date than most of the houses built in a clumsy gothic fashion and having a disproportionately high basement with shuttered windows. Though the hands of its clock were missing on the side, I glimpsed, and I knew that those hoarse strokes were telling the hour of eleven. Then suddenly, all thoughts of time were blotted out by an onrushing image of sharp intensity and unaccountable horror which had seized me before I knew what it really was. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside. And as I looked, a certain object crossed, or seemed to cross, that dark rectangle, burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare, which was all the more maddening because analysis could not show a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, the first except the driver that I had seen entering the compact part of the town. And had I been in a steadier mood, I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realized a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments, doubtless introduced since the Order of Dagon had modified the ritual of the local churches. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore, an almost exact duplicate of the one Miss Tilton had shown me the previous evening. This, acting on my imagination, had supplied namelessly sinister qualities to the indeterminate face and robed, shambling form beneath it. There was not, I soon decided, any reason why I should have felt that shuddering touch of evil pseudo-memory. Was it not natural that a local mystery cult should adopt among its regimentals a unique type of headdress, made familiar to the community in some strange way? Perhaps a treasure trove? A very thin sprinkling of repellent-looking youngish people now became visible on the sidewalks, lone individuals, and silent knots of two or three. The lower floors of the crumbling houses sometimes harbored small shops with dingy signs, and I noticed a park truck or two as we rattled along. The sound of waterfalls became more and more distinct, and presently, I saw a fairly deep river gorge ahead, spanned by a wide, iron-railed highway bridge, beyond which a large square opened out. 
As we clanked over the bridge, I looked out on both sides and observed some fancy buildings on the edge of the grassy bluff or part way down. The water far below was very abundant, and I could see two vigorous sets of falls upstream on my right and at least one downstream on my left. From this point, the noise was quite deafening. Then we rolled into the large semicircular square across the river and drew up on the right-hand side in front of a tall, cupola-crowned building with remnants of yellow paint and with a half a face sign proclaiming it to be the Gilman House. I was glad to get out of that bus and at once proceeded to check my valise in the shabby hotel lobby. There was only one person in sight, an elderly man with what I had come to call the Innsmouth look, and I decided not to ask him any of the questions which bothered me, remembering that odd things had been noticed in this hotel. Instead, I strolled out on the square from which the bus had already gone and studied the scene minutely and appraisingly. One side of the cobblestoned open space was a straight line of a river. The other was a semicircle of slant-roofed brick buildings of about the 1800 period, from which several streets radiated away to the southeast, south, and southwest. Lamps were depressingly few and small, all low-powered incandescents, and I was glad that my plans called for departure before dark, even though I knew the moon would be bright. The buildings were all in fair condition, and included perhaps a dozen shops in current operation, of which one was a grocery of the first national chain, others a dismal restaurant, a drugstore, and a wholesale fish dealer's office, and still another at the eastern extremity of the square near the river, an office of the town's only industry, the Marsh Refining Company. There were perhaps ten people visible, and four or five automobiles and motor trucks stood scattered about. I did not need to be told that this was the civic center of Innsmouth. Eastward, I could catch blue glimpses of the harbor, against which rose the decaying remains of three once beautiful Georgian steeples, and toward the shore on the opposite bank of the river, I saw the white belfry surmounting what I took to be the marsh refinery. For some reason or other, I chose to make my first inquiries at the chain grocery, whose personnel was not likely to be native to Innsmouth. I found a solitary boy of about sixteen in charge, and was pleased to note the brightness and affability which promised cheerful information. He seemed exceptionally eager to talk, and I soon gathered that he did not like the place, its fishy smell, or its furtive people. A word with any outsider was a relief to him. He hailed from Markham, boarded with a family who came from Ipswich, and went back home whenever he had a moment off. His family did not like him to work in his mouth, but the chain had transferred him there, and he did not wish to give up his job. There was, he said, no public library or chamber of commerce in his mouth, but I could probably find my way about. The street I had come down was federal, West of that were the fine old residence traits, Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams, and east of this were the shoreward slums. It was in these slums, along Main Street, that I would find the old Georgian churches, but they were all long abandoned. It would be well not to make oneself too conspicuous in such neighborhoods especially north of the river, since the people were sullen and hostile. Some strangers had even disappeared. 
certain spots were almost forbidden territory, as he had learned at considerable cost. One must not, for example, linger much around the marsh refinery, or around any of the still-used churches, or around the pillared order of Dagon Hall at the new church green. Those churches were very odd, all violently disavowed by their respective denominations elsewhere, and apparently using the strangest kind of ceremonials and clerical vestments. Their creeds were heterodox and mysterious, involving hints of certain marvelous transformations leading to bodily immortality of a sort on this earth. The youth's own pastor, Dr. Wallace of Ashby, M.E. Church in Arkham, had gravely urged him not to join any church in Innsmouth. As for the Innsmouth people, the youth hardly knew what to make of them. They were as furtive and seldom seen as animals that live in burrows, and one could hardly imagine how they passed the time apart from their desultory fishing. Perhaps, judging from the quantities of bootleg liquor they consumed, they lay for most of the daylight in an alcoholic stupor. They seemed sullenly banded together in some sort of fellowship and understanding, despising the world as if they had access to other and preferable spheres of entity. Their appearance, especially those staring, unwinking eyes, which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough, and their voices were disgusting. It was awful to hear them chanting in their churches at night, and especially during their main festivals and revivals, which fell twice a year on April 30th and October 31st. They were very fond of the water, and swam a great deal in both river and harbor, Swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common, and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. When one came to think of it, it was generally only rather young people who were seen about in public, and any of these, the oldest were apt to be the most tainted looking. When exceptions did occur, they were mostly persons with no trace of aberrancy like the old clerk at the hotel. One wondered what became of the bulk of the older folk, and whether the inn's mouth look were not a strange and insidious disease phenomenon which increased its hold as years advanced. Only a very rare affliction, of course, could bring about such vast and radical anatomical changes in a single individual after maturity changes involving osseous factors as basic as the shape of the skull. But then, even this aspect was no more baffling and unheard of than the visible features of the malady as a whole. It would be hard, the youth implied, to form any real conclusions regarding such a matter, since one never came to know the natives personally, no matter how long he lived in Innsmouth. The youth was certain that many specimens, even worse than the worst visible ones, were kept locked indoors in some places. People sometimes heard the strangest kind of sounds. The tottering waterfront hovels north of the river were reputedly connected by hidden tunnels, being thus a veritable warren of unseen abnormalities. One kind of foreign blood, if any, these beings had, it was impossible to tell. They sometimes kept certain especially repulsive characters out of sight, especially when government agents and others from the outside world came to town. It would be of no use, my informant said, to ask the natives anything about the place. The only one who would talk was a very aged but normal-looking man who lived at the poorhouse. This was on the north rim of the town, and he spent his time walking about or lounging around the fire station. 
This character, Zadok Allen, was 96 years old and somewhat touched in the head, besides being the town drunkard. He was a strange, furtive creature who constantly looked over his shoulder as if afraid of something, and when sober, could not be persuaded to talk at all with strangers. He was, however, unable to resist any offer of his favorite poison, and once drunk, would furnish the most astonishing fragments of whispered reminiscence. After all, though, this useful data could be gained from him, since his stories were all insane, incomplete hints of impossible marvels and horrors, which could have no source save in his own disordered fantasy. Nobody ever believed him, but the natives did not like him to drink and talk with strangers, and it was not always safe to be seen questioning him. It was probably from him that some of the wildest popular whispers and delusions were derived. Several non-native residents had reported monstrous glimpses from time to time, but between old Zadok's tales and the malformed denizens, it was no wonder such illusions were current. None of the non-natives ever stayed out at night, there being a widespread impression that it was not wise to do so. Besides, the streets were lonesomely dark. As for business, the abundance of fish was certainly almost uncanny. But the natives were taking less and less advantage of this. Moreover, prices were falling, and competition was growing. Of course, the town's real business was the refinery, whose commercial office was on the square, only a few doors east of where we stood. Old Man Marsh was never seen, but sometimes went to the works in a closed curtain car. There were all sorts of rumors about how Marsh had come to look. He had once been a great dandy, and some people said he still wore the frock-coated finery of the Edwardian age, curiously adapted to certain deformities. His sons had formerly conducted the office in the square, but latterly, they had been keeping out of sight a good deal and leaving the brunt of affairs to the younger generation. Their sons and their sisters had come to look very strange, especially the elder ones, and it was said that their health was failing. One of the Marsh daughters was a repellent, reptilian-looking woman who wore an excess of weird jewelry, clearly of the same exotic tradition as that to which the strange tiara belonged. My informant had noticed it many times, and had heard it spoken of as coming from some secret horde, either of pirates or demons. The clergymen, or priests, or whatever they were called, also wore this kind of ornament as a headdress, but one seldom caught glimpses of them. Other specimens the youth had not seen, though many were rumored to exist around Innsmouth. The Marshes, together with the three gently bred families of the town, the Waits, the Gilmans, and the Elliots, were all very retiring. They lived in immense houses along Washington Street, and several were reputed to harbor, in concealment, certain living kinsfolk, whose personal aspect forbade public view, and whose deaths had been reported and recorded. Warning me that many of the street signs were down, the youth drew for my benefit a rough but ample and painstaking sketch of the town's salient features. After a moment's study, I felt sure it would be of great help, and placed it in my pocket with profuse thanks. Disliking the dinginess of the single restaurant I had seen, I bought a fair supply of cheese crackers and ginger wafers to serve as lunch later on. My program, I decided, would be to thread the principal streets 
talk with any non-natives I might encounter and catch the 8 o'clock coach for Arkham. The town I could see formed a significant and exaggerated example of communal decay, but being no sociologist, I would limit my serious observations to the field of architecture. Thus, I began my systematic, though half-bewildered tour of Innsmouth's narrow, shadow-blighted ways, crossing the bridge and turning towards the roar of the lower falls. I passed close to the marsh refinery. This seemed oddly free from the noise of industry. This building stood on a steep river bluff near a bridge and an open confluence of streets, which I took to be the earliest civic center, displaced after the revolution by the present town square. Recrossing the gorge on the main street bridge, I struck a region of utter desertion, which somehow made me shudder. Collapsing huddles of gambrel roofs formed a jagged and fantastic skyline above which rose the ghoulish, decapitated steeple of an ancient church. Some houses along Main Street were tenanted, but most were tightly boarded up. Down unpaved side streets I saw the black, gaping windows of deserted hovels, many of which leaned at perilous and incredible angles. Through the sinking of part of the foundations, these windows stared so spectrally and it took courage to turn eastward towards the waterfront. Certainly, the terror of a deserted house swells in geometrical progression as houses multiply to form a city of stark desolation. The sight of such endless avenues of fishy-eyed vacancy and death, and the thought of such linked infinities of black, brooding compartments, given over to cobwebs and memories, and the conqueror worm starred up vestigial fears and aversions that not even the stoutest philosophy can disperse. Fish Street was as deserted as Maine, though it differed in having many brick and stone warehouses still in excellent shape. Water Street was almost its duplicate, save that there were great seaward gaps where worms had been. Not a living thing did I see, except for the scattered fishermen on the distant breakwater, and not a sound did I hear, save the lapping of the harbor tides and the roar of the falls in the Manuext. The town was getting more and more on my nerves, and I looked behind me furtively as I picked my way back over the tottering water street bridge. The Fish Street Bridge, according to the sketch, was in ruins. North of the river, there were traces of squalid life, active fish-packing houses in Water Street, smoking chimneys, and patched roofs here and there, occasional sounds from indeterminate sources, and infrequent shambling forms in the dismal streets and unpaved lanes. But I seem to find this even more oppressive than the southerly desertion. For one thing, the people were more hideous and abnormal than those near the center of the town, so that I was several times evilly reminded of something utterly fantastic which I could not place. Undoubtedly, the alien strain in the Innsmouth folk was stronger here than farther inland. Unless, indeed, the Innsmouth look were a disease rather than a blood strain, in which case this district might be held to harbor the more advanced cases. One detail that annoyed me was the distribution of the few faint sounds I heard. They ought, naturally, to have come wholly from the visibly inhabited houses, yet in reality were often strongest inside the most rigidly boarded up facades. There were creepings, scurryings, and hoarse, doubtful noises, and I thought uncomfortably about the hidden tunnels suggested by the grocery boy. 
Suddenly, I found myself wondering what the voices of those denizens would be like. I had heard no speech so far in this quarter, and was unaccountably anxious not to do so. Pausing only long enough to look at two fine but ruinous old churches at Main and Church Streets, I hastened out of that vile waterfront slum. My next logical goal was New Church Green, but somehow or other, I could not bear to repass the church in whose basement I had glimpsed the inexplicably frightening form of that strangely diademed priest or pastor. Besides, the grocery youth had told me that the churches, as well as the Order of Dagon Hall, were not advisable for strangers. Accordingly, I kept north along Maine to Martin, then turning inland, crossed Federal Street, safely north of the Green, and entering the decayed Patrician neighborhood of Northern Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams Streets. Though these stately old avenues were ill-serviced and unkempt, their elm-shaded dignity had not entirely departed. Mansion after mansion claimed my gaze, most of them decrepit and boarded up amidst neglected grounds, but one or two in each street showing signs of occupancy. In Washington Street, there was a row of four or five in excellent repair, and with finely tended lawns and gardens, the most sumptuous of these with wide terraced parterres extending back the entire way to Lafayette Street. I took to be the home of Old Man Marsh, the afflicted refinery owner. In all these streets, no living thing was visible, and I wondered at the complete absence of cats and dogs from Innsmouth. Another thing which puzzled and disturbed me, even in some of the best preserved mansions, was the tightly shuttered condition of many third-story and attic windows. Furtiveness and secretiveness seemed universal in this hushed city of alienage and death, and I could not escape the sensation of being watched from ambush on every hand by sly, staring eyes that never shut. I shivered as the cracked stroke of three sounded from a belfry to my left. Too well did I recall the squat church from which those notes came. Following Washington Street toward the river, I now faced a new zone of former industry and commerce, noting the ruins of factory ahead and seeing others with the traces of an old railway station. The uncertain bridge before me was posted with a warning sign, but I took the risk and crossed again to the south bank, where traces of life reappeared. Furtive, shambling creatures stared cryptically in my direction, and more normal faces eyed me coldly and curiously. Inn's mouth was rapidly becoming intolerable, and I turned down Payne Street towards the square in the hope of getting some vehicle to take me to Arkham before the still distant starting time of that sinister bus. It was then that I saw the tumble-down fire station on my left and noticed the red-faced, bushy-bearded, watery-eyed old man in nondescript rags who sat on a bench in front of it, talking with a pair of unkempt but not abnormal-looking firemen. This, of course, must be Zadok Helen. The half-crazed, licorice, non-agenarian, whose tales of old in smell and its shadow were so hideous and incredible. Chapter 3 It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark, hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying toward the square in an effort 
to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed, and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay, with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went around his mouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the firemen would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then, I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store, just off Square, in Elliott Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of that staring, in-mouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers, and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw the luck was in for me, for, shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realized that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me. I turned onto Wheat Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery store boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south, I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf and being free to question old Zadok, unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street, I could hear a faint and wheezy, Hey, mister, behind me, but I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length, I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf projecting beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water 
promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for our long secret talk. So I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tipper. Meanwhile, eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into stupor. After an hour, his furtive nature showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize in sentious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whiskey would not be enough to produce results and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, Chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn. This caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses, which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints which could not be mistaken. As the old man's whisper grew fainter, and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. He talked for ages and ages, until he faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he did not answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it some sort of crude allegory based upon the strangenesses of Innsmouth and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps and exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any real substantial foundation, but nonetheless, the account held a hint of genuine terror, if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen at Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories or lies of the bygone Obed himself, rather than of this antique topper. I handed Sadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whiskey for not even a trace of thickness had come to his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself. I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter, 
and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained, bushy whiskers. Yes, he was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair portion of them. Until he stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes, I feared he was close to a stupor after all. But when I gently shook his shoulder, he turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out more obscure phrases. He rambled on and on. The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he had begun to cackle evilly. The old man was getting hysterical now, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. And then he rambled again, and again, and his words seemed less like words. Eventually, Zadok was showing signs of fright and exhaustion, and I let him keep silence for a while, glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned, and was coming in now, and the sound of the waves seemed to arouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy smell might not be so bad. Again, I strained to catch his whispers. He was speaking of a horde, somewhere in Manuext, a proclamation of treason. And then he was panting and perspiring profusely, his grip on my shoulder tightened. He spoke of a morning, of worship, of death, Dagon. There were sacrifices of strangers. And then he spoke in tongue. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul. To what pitiful depths of hallucination had this liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and disease around him, brought that fertile imaginative brain. He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard. He was so scared as he spoke, he called out to God over and over of the civil war and other deaths there, and Dagon again. I was confused by his references to child sacrifices. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out toward the reef. And despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. He screamed of the Order of Dagon over and over and of sacrifices, turning the old people crazy. He was really screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I care to admit. He yelled at me as a young feller on the streets, asking him to speak of devils. The hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of this old man's shrieking almost made me faint. His eyes, looking past me toward the malodorous sea, were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing I could see, only the incoming tide, 
with perhaps one set of ripples more local than a long-flung line of breakers. But now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently, his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of this town, son. Run for it, he said. Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone morph and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. Before I could recover my shattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland toward the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there. And when I reached Water Street and looked along it toward north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen. He was gone. Chapter 4 I can hardly describe the mood in which I was left by this harrowing episode. An episode at once mad and pitiful, grotesque and terrifying. A grocery boy had prepared me for it, yet the reality left me nonetheless bewildered and disturbed. Puerile though the story was, old Zadok's insane earnestness and horror had communicated to me a mounting unrest which joined with my earlier sense of loathing for the town and its blight of intangible shadow. Later, I might sift the tale and extract some nucleus of historic allegory. Just now, I wish to put it out of my head. The hour had grown perilously late. My watch said 7.15, and the Arkham bus left town square at 8. So I tried to give my thoughts as neutral and practical a cast as possible. Meanwhile, walking rapidly through the deserted streets of gaping roofs and leaning houses, toward the hotel where I had checked my bag and would find my bus. Though the golden light of late afternoon gave the ancient roofs and decrepit chimneys an air of mystic loveliness and peace, I could not help glancing over my shoulder now and then. I would surely be very glad to get out of Melodorous and fear shadowed in's mouth and wish there were some other vehicle than the bus, driven by that sinister-looking fellow sergeant. Yet I did not hurry too precipitately, for there were architectural details worth viewing at every silent corner, and I could easily, I calculated, cover the necessary distance in a half hour. Studying the grocery youth's map and seeking a route I had not traversed before, I chose Marsh Street instead of State for my approach to Town Square. Near the corner of Ball Street, I began to see scattered groups of furtive whisperers, and when I finally reached the square, I saw that almost all the loiterers were congregated around the door of the Gilman House. It seemed as if many bulging, watery, and unwinking eyes looked oddly at me as I claimed my bag in the lobby, and I hoped that none of these unpleasant creatures would be my fellow passengers on the coach. The bus, rather early, rattled in with three passengers somewhat before eight, and an evil-looking fellow on the sidewalk muttered a few indistinguishable words to the driver. The sergeant threw out a mail bag and a roll of newspapers and entered the hotel while the passengers, the same men whom I had seen arriving in Newburyport that morning, shambled to the sidewalk and exchanged some faint, guttural words with a loafer in a language I could have sworn was not English. I boarded the empty coach and took the same seat I had taken before, but was hardly settled before Sergeant reappeared 
and began mumbling in a throaty voice of peculiar repulsiveness. I was, it appeared, in very bad luck. There had been something wrong with the engine, despite the excellent time made from Newburyport, and the bus could not complete the journey to Arkham. No, it could not possibly be repaired that night, nor was there any other way of getting transportation out of Innsmouth, either to Arkham or elsewhere. The sergeant was sorry, but I would have to stop over at the Gilman. Probably the clerk would make the price easy for me, but there was nothing else to do. Almost dazed by this sudden obstacle, and violently dreading the fall of night in this decaying and half-unlighted town, I left the bus and re-entered the hotel lobby, where the sullen, strange-looking night clerk told me I could have room for 24 on the next top floor, large, but without running water, for one dollar. Despite what I had heard of this hotel in Newburyport, I signed the register, paid my dollar, let the clerk take my bag, and followed that sour, solitary attendant up three creaking flights of stairs, past dusty corridors, which seemed wholly devoid of life. My room, a dismal rear one with two windows and bare, cheap furnishings, overlooked a dingy courtyard, otherwise hemmed in by low, deserted brick blocks, and commanded a view of decrepit, westward stretching roofs, with a marshy countryside beyond. At the end of the corridor was a bathroom, a discouraging relic with an ancient marble bowl, tin tub faint electric light, and musty wooden paneling all around the plumbing fixtures. It still being daylight, I descended to the square and looked around for a dinner of some sort, noticing as I did so the strange glances I received from the unwholesome loafers. Since the grocery was closed, I was forced to patronize the restaurant I had shunned before. The stooped, narrow-headed man with staring, unwinking eyes, and a flat-nosed wench with unbelievably thick, clumsy hands being in attendance. The service was of the counter type, and it relieved me to find that much was evidently served from cans and packages. A bowl of vegetable soup with crackers was enough for me, and I soon headed back for my cheerless room at the Gilman, Getting an evening paper and a fly-speckled magazine from the evil-visaged clerk at the rickety stand beside his desk. As twilight deepened, I turned on the one feeble electric bulb over the cheap, iron-framed bed and tried as best as I could to continue the reading I had begun. I felt it advisable to keep my mind wholesomely occupied for it would not do to brood over the abnormalities of this ancient, light-shadowed town while I was still within its borders. The insane yarn I had heard from the aged drunkard did not promise very pleasant dreams, and I felt I must keep the image of his wild, watery eyes as far as possible from my imagination. Also, I must not dwell on what that factory inspector had told the Newburyport ticket agent about the Gilman house and the voices of its nocturnal tenants. Not on that, nor on the face beneath the tiara in the black church doorway, the face for whose horror my conscious mind could not account. It would perhaps have been easier to keep my thoughts from disturbing topics had the room not been so gruesomely musty as it was. The lethal mustiness blended hideously with the town's general fishy odor and persistently focused one's fancy on death and decay. Another thing that disturbed me was the absence of a bolt on the door of my room. One had been there, as marks clearly showed, but there were signs of recent removal. No doubt it had become out of order, 
Like so many other things in this decrepit edifice, in my nervousness, I looked around and discovered a bolt on the clothes press, which seemed to be of the same size, judging from the marks, as the one formerly on the door. To gain a partial relief from the general tension, I busied myself by transforming this hardware to the vacant place with the aid of a handy three-in-one device, including a screwdriver, which I kept on my keyring. The bolt fit perfectly, and I was somewhat relieved when I knew I could shoot it firmly upon retiring. Not that I had any real apprehension of its need, but that any symbol of security was welcome in an environment of this kind. There were adequate bolts on the two lateral doors to connecting rooms, and these I proceeded to fashion. I did not undress, but decided to read until I was sleepy, and then lie down with only my coat, collar, and shoes off, taking a pocket flashlight from my bag. I placed it in my trousers so that I could read my watch if I woke up later in the dark. Drowsiness, however, did not come. And when I stopped to analyze my thoughts, I found to my disquiet that I was really unconsciously listening for something. Listening for something which I dreaded, but could not name. That inspector's story must have worked on my imagination more deeply than I had suspected. Again, I tried to read, but found I made no progress. After a time... I seemed to hear the stairs and corridors creak at intervals, as if with footsteps, and wondered if the other rooms were beginning to fill up. There were no voices, however, and it struck me that there was something suddenly furtive about the creaking. I did not like it, and debated whether I had better try to sleep at all. This town had some strange people and there had undoubtedly been several disappearances. Was this one of those inns where travelers were slain for their money? Surely, I had no look of excessive prosperity. Or were the townsfolk really so resentful about curious visitors? Had my obvious sightseeing, with its frequent map consultations, aroused unfavorable notice? It occurred to me that I must be in a highly nervous state to let a few random creakings set me off, speculating in this fashion. But I regretted none the less that I was unarmed. At length, feeling a fatigue which had nothing of drowsiness in it, I bolted the newly outfitted hall door, turned off the light, and threw myself down on the hard, uneven bed, coat, collar, shoes, and all. In the darkness, every faint noise of the night seemed magnified, and a flood of unpleasant thoughts swept over me. I was sorry I had put out the light, yet was too tired to rise and turn it on again. Then, after a long, dreary interval, and prefaced by a fresh creaking of stairs and corridor, there came that soft, unmistakable sound which seemed like a malign fulfillment of all my apprehensions. Without the least shadow of a doubt, the lock on my hall door was being tried, cautiously, furtively, tentatively, with a key. My sensations upon recognizing this sign of actual peril were perhaps less rather than more tumultuous because of my previous vague fears. I had been, albeit, without definite reason, instinctively on my guard, and that was to my advantage in the new and real crisis, whatever it might turn out to be. Nevertheless, the change in the menace from vague premonition to immediate reality was a profound shock, and fell upon me with the force of a genuine blow. It never once occurred to me that the fumbling might be a mere mistake. The line purpose was all I could think of. And I kept deathly quiet, awaiting the would-be intruder's next move. After a time, the cautious rattling ceased, and I heard the room to the north entered with a passkey. 
Then the lock of the connecting door to my room was softly tried. The bolt held, of course, and I heard the floor creak as the prowler left the room. After a moment, there came another soft rattling, and I knew that the room to the south of me was being entered. Again, a furtive trying of a bolted connecting door, and again, a receding creaking. This time, the creaking went along the hall and down the stairs, so I knew that the prowler had realized the bolted condition of my doors and was giving up his attempt for a greater or lesser time, as the future would show. The readiness with which I fell into a plan of action proves that I must have been subconsciously fearing some menace and considering possible avenues of escape for hours. From the first, I felt that the unseen fumbler meant a danger not to be met or dealt with, but only to be fled from as quickly as possible. The one thing to do was to get out of that hotel alive as quickly as I could and through some channel other than the front stairs and lobby. Rising softly and throwing my flashlight on the switch, I sought to light the bulb over my bed in order to choose and pocket some belongings for a swift, bagless flight. Nothing, however, happened, and I saw that the power had been cut off. Clearly, some cryptic, evil movement was afoot on a large scale. Just what, I could not say. As I stood pondering with my hand on the now useless switch, I heard a muffled creaking on the floor below. I thought I could barely distinguish voices in conversation. A moment later, I felt less sure that the deeper sounds were voices, since the apparent hoarse barkings and loose-syllabled croakings bore so little resemblance to recognized human speech. Then I thought with renewed force just what the factory inspector had heard in the night. Having filled my pockets with the flashlight's aid, I put on my hat and tiptoed to the windows to consider chances of descent. Despite the state's safety regulations, there was no fire escape on this side of the hotel, and I saw that my window commanded only a sheer three-story drop to the cobbled courtyard. On the left and right, however, some ancient brick business blocks abutted the hotel, their slant roofs coming up to a reasonable jumping distance from my fourth-story level. To reach either of these lines of buildings, I would have to be in a room two doors from my own, in one case on the north and in the other case on the south and my mind instantly set to work, calculating what chances I had of making the transfer. Chapter 5 I could not, I decided, risk an emergence into the corridor, where my footsteps would surely be heard, and where the difficulties of entering the desired room would be insuperable. My progress if it was to be made at all, would have to be through the less solidly built connecting doors of the rooms, the locks and bolts of which I would have to force violently, using my shoulder as a battering ram whenever they were set against me. This, I thought, would be possible owing to the rickety nature of the house and its fixtures, but I realized I could not do it noiselessly. I would have to count on sheer speed, and the chance of getting to a window before any hostile forces became coordinated enough to open the door was slim. My own outer door I reinforced by pushing the bureau against it, little by little, in order to make a minimum of sound. I perceived that my chances were very slender, and was fully prepared for any calamity. Even getting to another roof would not solve the problem, for there would then remain the task of reaching the ground and escaping from the town. One thing in my favor 
was the deserted and ruinous state of the abutting buildings, and the number of skylights gaping blackly open in each row. Gathering from the grocery boy's map that the best route out of town was southward, I glanced first at the connecting door on the south side of the room. It was designed to open in my direction, hence I saw, after drawing the bolt and finding other fastenings in place. It was not a favorable one for forcing. Accordingly, abandoning it as a route, I cautiously moved the bedstead against it to hamper any attack which might be made on it later from the next room. The door on the north was hung to open away from me, and this, though a test proved it to be locked or bolted from the other side, I knew must be my route. If I could gain the roofs of the buildings in Payne Street and descend successfully to the ground level, I might, perhaps, dart through the courtyard and the adjacent or opposite buildings to Washington or Bates, or else emerge in Payne and edge around southward into Washington. In any case, I would aim to strike Washington somehow and get quickly out of the town square region. My preference would be to avoid pain since the fire station there might be open all night. As I thought of these things, I looked out over the squalid sea of decaying roofs below me now brightened by the beams of a moon not much past fall. On the right, the black gash of the river clove the panorama, abandoned factories and railway station clinging barnacle-like to its sides. Beyond it, the rusted railway and the rally led off through a flat, marshy terrain dotted with hislets of higher and drier scrub-grown land. On the left, the creek-threaded countryside was nearer, a narrow road to Ipswich, gleaming white in the moonlight. I could not see from my side of the hotel the southward route toward Arkham, which I was determined to take. I was speculating on whether I had better attack the northern door, and on how I could at least audibly manage it, when I noticed that the vague noises underfoot had given place to a fresh, and heavier creaking of the stairs. A wavering flicker of light showed through my transom, and the boards of the corridor began to groan with a ponderous load. Muffled sounds of possible vocal origin approached, and at length a firm knock came at my outer door. For a moment, I simply held my breath and waited. Eternities seemed to elapse, and the nauseous, fishy odor of my environment seemed to mount suddenly and spectacularly. Then the knocking was repeated, continuously, with growing insistence. I knew that the time for action had come, and forthwith drew the bolt of the northward connecting door, bracing myself for the task of battering it open. The knocking waxed louder, and I hoped that its volume would cover the sound of my efforts. At last, beginning my attempt, I lunged again and again at the thin paneling with my left shoulder, heedless of shock or pain. The door resisted even more than I had expected, but I did not give in. And all the while, the clamor at the outer door increased. Finally, the connecting door gave, but with such a crash that I knew those outside must have heard. Instantly, the outside knocking became a violent battering, while keys sounded ominously in the hall doors of the rooms on both sides of me. Rushing through the newly opened connection, I succeeded in bolting the northerly hall door before the lock could be turned, but even as I did so, I heard the hall door of the third room, the one from whose window I had hoped to reach the roof below, being tried with a pass key. For an instant, I felt absolute despair, 
since my trapping in a chamber with no window seemed complete. A wave of almost abnormal horror swept over me and invested with a terrible but unexplainable singularity the flash-like glimpsed dust prints made by the intruder who had lately tried my door from this room. Then, with a dazed automatism which persisted despite hopelessness, I made for the next connecting door and performed the blind motion of pushing at it in an effort to get through and, granting the fastenings might be as intact as in the second room, pulled the hall door beyond before the lock could be turned from outside. Sheer fortunate chance gave me my reprieve, for the connecting door before me was not only unlocked, but actually ajar. In a second, I was through, and had my right knee and shoulder against a hall door, which was visibly opening inward. My pressure took the opener off guard, for the thing I shut as I pushed, so that I could slip the well-conditioned bolt as I had done with the other door. As I gained this respite, I heard the battering at the two other doors abate, while a confused clatter came from the connecting door I had shielded with the bedstead. Evidently, the bulk of my assailants had entered the southerly room, unremassing a lateral attack. But at the same moment, a pass key sounded in the next door to the north, and I knew that a nearer peril was at hand. The northward connecting door was wide open, but there was no time to think about checking the already turning lock in the hall. All I could do was to shut and bolt the open connecting door, as well as its mate on the opposite side, pushing a bedstead against the one and a bureau against the other, and moving a washstand in front of the hall door. I must, I saw, trust to such makeshift barriers to shield me till I could get out the window and onto the roof of the Payne Street block. But even in this acute moment, my chief horror was something from the immediate weakness of my defenses. I was shuddering because not one of my pursuers, despite some hideous pantings, gruntings, and subdued barkings at odd intervals, was uttering an unmuffled or intelligible vocal sound. As I moved the furniture and rushed towards the windows, I heard a frightful scurrying along the corridor toward the room north of me and perceived that the southward battering had ceased. Plainly, most of my opponents were about to concentrate against the feeble connecting door which they knew must open directly on me. Outside, the moon played on the ridge pole of the block below, and I saw that the jump would be desperately hazardous because of the steep surface on which I must land. Surveying the conditions, I chose the more southerly of the two windows as my avenue of escape, planning to land on the inner slope of the roof and make for the nearest skylight. Once inside one of the decrepit brick structures, I would have to reckon with pursuit. But I hoped to descend and dodge in and out of yawning doorways along the shadowed courtyard, eventually getting to Washington Street and slipping out of town toward the south. The clatter at the northerly connecting door was now terrific and I saw that the weak paneling was beginning to splinter. Obviously, the besiegers had brought some ponderous object into play as a battering ram. The bedstead, however, still held firm, so that I had, at least, a faint chance of making good my escape. As I opened the window, I noticed that it was flanked by heavy velour draperies suspended from a pole by brass rings and also that there was a large projecting catch for the shutters on the exterior. Seeing a possible means of avoiding the dangerous jump, I yanked at the hangings and brought them down, 
pole and all, then quickly hooking two of the rings in the shutter catch and flinging the drapery outside. The heavy folds reached fully to the abutting roof, and I saw that the rings and catch would be likely to bear my weight. So, climbing out of the window and down the improvised rope ladder, I left behind me forever the morbid and horror-infested fabric of the Gilman house. I landed safely on the loose slats of the steep roof and succeeded in gaining the gaping black skylight without a slip. Glancing up at the window I had left, I observed it was still dark, though far across the crumbling chimneys to the north, I could see lights ominously blazing in the order of Dagon Hall, the Baptist Church, and the Congressional Church, which I recalled so shiveringly. There had seemed to be no one in the courtyard below, and I hoped there would be a chance to get away before the spreading of a general alarm. Flashing my pocket lamp into the skylight, I saw that there were no steps down. The distance was slight, however, so I clambered over the brink and dropped, striking a dusty floor littered with crumbling boxes and barrels. The place was ghoulish looking, but I was past minding such impressions and made at once for the staircase reached by my flashlight after a hasty glance at my watch, which showed the hour to be 2 a.m. The steps creaked, but seemed tolerably sound, and I raced down past a barn-like second story to the ground floor. The desolation was complete, and only echoes answered my footfalls. At length, I reached the lower hall, at one end of which I saw a faint, luminous rectangle marking the ruined Payne Street doorway. Heading the other way, I found the back door also open and darted out and down five stone steps to the grass-grown cobblestones of the courtyard. The moonbeams did not reach down here, but I could just see my way about without using the flashlight. Some of the windows on the Gilman house side were faintly glowing, and I thought I heard confused sounds within. Walking softly over to the Washington Street side, I perceived several open doorways and chose the nearest as my route out. The hallway inside was black, and when I reached the opposite end, I saw that the street door was wedged immovably shut. Resolved to try another building, I groped my way back toward the courtyard, but stopped short when close to the doorway. For out of an open door in the Gilman house, a large crowd of doubtful shapes was pouring, lanterns bobbing in the darkness, and horrible croaking voices exchanging low cries in what was certainly not English. The figures moved uncertainly, and I realized to my relief that they did not know where I had gone. But for all that, they sent a shiver of horror through my frame. Their features were indistinguishable, but their crouching, shambling gait was abominably repellent. And worst of all, I perceived that one figure was strangely robed and unmistakably surmounted by a tall tiara of a design altogether too familiar. As the figures spread throughout the courtyard, I felt my fears increase. Suppose I could find no egress from this building on the street side. The fishy odor was detestable, and I wondered I could stand it without fainting. Again, groping toward the street, I opened a door off the hall and came upon an empty room with a closely shuttered but sashless window. Fumbling in the rays of my flashlight, I found I could open the shutters, and in another moment, had climbed outside and was carefully closing the aperture in its original manner. I was now in Washington Street, and for the moment, 
saw no living thing nor any light save that of the moon. From several directions in the distance, however, I could hear the sound of hoarse voices, of footsteps, and of a curious kind of pattering, which did not sound quite like footsteps. Plainly, I had no time to lose. The points of the compass were clear to me, and I was glad that all the street lights were turned off, as is often the custom on strongly moonlit nights in unprosperous rural regions. Some of the sounds came from the south, yet I retained my design of escaping in that direction. There would, I knew, be plenty of deserted doorways to shelter me in case I met any person or group who looked like pursuers. I walked rapidly, softly, and close to the ruined houses. While hatless and disheveled after my arduous climb, I did not look especially noticeable and stood a good chance of passing unheeded if forced to encounter any casual wayfarer. At Bates Street, I drew into a yawning vestibule while two shambling figures crossed in front of me, but was soon on my way again, and, approaching the open space where Elliott Street obliquely crosses Washington at the intersection of South. Though I had never seen this space, it had looked dangerous to me on the grocery use map, since the moonlight would have free play there. There was no use trying to evade it, for any alternative course would involve detours of possibly disastrous visibility and delaying effects. The only thing to do was to cross it boldly and openly, imitating the typical shamble of the Innsmouth folk as best I could, and trusting that no one, or at least no pursuer of mine, would be there. Just how fully the pursuit was organized, and indeed, just what its purpose might be, I could form no idea. There seemed to be unusual activity in the town, but I judged that the news of my escape from the Gilman had not yet spread. I would, of course, soon have to shift from Washington to some other southward street, for that party from the hotel would doubtless be after me. I must have left dust prints in that last old building, revealing how I gained the street. The open space was, as I expected, strongly moonlit, and I saw the remains of a park-like, iron-railed green in its center. Fortunately, no one was about, though a curious sort of buzz or roar seemed to be increasing in the direction of Town Square. My progress was unimpeded, and no fresh sound arose to hint that I had been spied. Glancing about me, I involuntarily let my pace slacken for a second to take in the sight of the sea, gorgeous in the burning moonlight at the street's end. Far out beyond the breakwater was the dim, dark line of Devil Reef, and as I glimpsed it, I could not help thinking of all the hideous legends I had heard in the last 34 hours. Legends, which portrayed this ragged rock as a veritable gateway to realms of unfathomed horror and inconceivable abnormality. Then, without warning, I saw the intermittent flashes of light on the distant reef. They were definite and unmistakable and awakened in my mind a blind horror beyond all rational proportion. My muscles tightened for a panic flight, held in only by a certain unconscious caution and a half-hypnotic fascination. And, to make matters worse, there now flashed forth from the lofty cupola of the Gilman House, which loomed up to the northeast behind me, a series of analogous, though differently spaced, gleams, which could be nothing less than an answering signal. Controlling my muscles, and realizing afresh how plainly visible I was, I resumed my brisker and feignedly shambled pace, though keeping my eyes on the hellish, 
an ominous reef, as long as the opening of South Street gave me a seaward view. What the whole proceeding meant, I could not imagine, unless it involved some strange rite connected with Devil Reef, or unless some party had landed from a ship on that sinister rock. I now bent to the left around the ruinous green, still gazing toward the ocean as it blazed in the spectral summer moonlight, and watching the cryptical flashing of those nameless, unexplainable beacons. It was then that the most horrible impression of all was borne in upon me, the impression which destroyed my last vestige of self-control and sent me running frantically southward past the yawning black doorways and fishily staring windows of that deserted, nightmare street. For a closer glance, I saw that the moonlit waters between the reef and the shore were far from empty. They were alive, with a teeming horde of shapes swimming inward toward the town, and, even at my vast distance, and in my single moment of perception, I could tell but the bobbing heads and flailing arms were alien and aberrant in a way scarcely to be expressed or consciously formulated. My frantic running ceased before I had covered a block, for at my left I began to hear something like the hue or cry of organized pursuit. There were footsteps and guttural sounds, and a rattling motor wheezed south along Federal Street. In a second, all my plans were utterly changed. For if the southward highway were blocked ahead of me, I must clearly find another egress from Inn's mouth. I paused and drew into a gaping doorway, reflecting how lucky I was to have left the moonlit open space before these pursuers came down the parallel street. A second reflection was less comforting. Since the pursuit was down another street, it was plain that the party was not following me directly. It had not seen me, but was simply obeying a general plan of cutting off my escape. This, however, implied that all roads leading out of Innsmouth were similarly patrolled, for the denizens could not have known which route I intended to take. If this were so... I would have to make my retreat across country, away from any road. But how could I do that in view of the marsh and creek-riddled nature of the surrounding region? For a moment, my brain reeled, both from sheer hopelessness and from a rapid increase in the omnipresent, fishy odor. Then I thought of the abandoned railway to Raleigh, whose solid line of ballasted, weed-grown earth still stretched off to the northwest from the crumbling station on the edge of the river gorge. There was just a chance that the townsfolk would not think of that, since its briar-choked desertion made it half impassable, and the unlikeliest of all avenues for a fugitive to choose. I had seen it clearly from my hotel window, and knew how it lay. Most of its earlier length was uncomfortably visible from the rally road and from high places in the town itself, but one could perhaps crawl inconspicuously through the undergrowth. At any rate, it would form my only chance of deliverance, and there was nothing I could do but try. Drawing inside the hall of my deserted shelter, I once more consulted the grocery boy's map with the aid of my flashlight. The immediate problem was how to reach the ancient railway, and I now saw that the safest course was ahead to Babson Street, then west to Lafayette, there edging around, but not crossing an open space, homologous to the one I had traversed, and subsequently back northward and westward in a zigzagging line through Lafayette, Bates, Adams, and Bank Streets, the latter skirting the river gorge, to the abandoned and dilapidated station I had seen from my window. My reason for going ahead to Babson was that I wished neither to recross the earlier open space, 
nor to begin my westward course along a cross street as broad as south. Starting once more, I crossed the street to the right-hand side in order to edge around into Babson as inconspicuously as possible. The noises still continued in Federal Street, and as I glanced behind me, I thought I saw a gleam of light near the building through which I had escaped. Anxious to leave Washington Street, I broke into a quiet trot, trusting to luck not to encounter any observing eye. Next, the corner of Babson Street I saw to my alarm that one of the houses was still inhabited, as attested by curtains at the windows, but there were no lights within, and I passed it without disaster. In Babson Street, which crossed Federal, and might thus reveal me to my searchers, I clung as closely as possible to the sagging, uneven buildings, twice pausing in a doorway as the noises behind me momentarily increased. The open space ahead shone wide and desolate under the moon, but my route would not force me to cross it. During my second pause, I began to detect a fresh distribution of the vague sounds, and, upon looking cautiously out from cover, beheld a motor car darting across the open space, bound outward along Elliott Street, which there intersects both Babson and Lafayette. As I watched, choked by a sudden rise in the fishy odor after a short abatement, I saw a band of uncouth, crouching shapes, loping and shambling in the same direction, and knew this must be the party guarding the Ipswich Road, since that highway forms an extension of Elliott Street. Two of the figures I glimpsed were in voluminous robes, and one wore a peaked diadem which glistened whitely in the moonlight. The gait of this figure was so odd that it sent a chill through me, for it seemed to me the creature was almost hopping. When the last band was out of sight, I resumed my progress, darting around the corner into Lafayette Street and crossing Elliot very hurriedly, lest stragglers of the party be still advancing along the thoroughfare. I did hear some croaking and clattering sounds far off toward Town Square, but accomplished my passage without disaster. My greatest dread was in recrossing Broad and Moonlit South Street with its seaward view, and I had to nerve myself for the ordeal. Someone might easily be looking, and possible Elliot Street stragglers could not fail to glimpse me from either of two points. At the last moment, I decided I had better slacken my trot and make the crossing as before in the shambling gait of an average Innsmouth native. When the view of the water again opened out, this time on my right, I was half determined not to look at it at all. I could not, however, resist but cast a sidelong glance as I carefully shambled toward the protecting shadows ahead. There were no ship visible, as I had half expected there would be. Instead, the first thing which caught my eye was a small rowboat pulling in toward the abandoned wharves and laden with some bulky tarpaulin-covered object. Its rowers, though distantly and indistinctly seen, were of an especially repellent aspect. Several swimmers were still discernible, while on the far black reef I could see a faint, steady glow, unlike the winking beacon visible before, and of a curious color which I could not precisely identify. Above the slant roofs ahead, and to the right, there loomed the tall cupola of the Gilman House, but it was completely dark. The fishy odor, dispelled for a moment by some merciful breeze, now closed in again with maddening intensity. I had not quite crossed the street when I heard a muttering band advancing along Washington from the north. 
as they reached the broad open space where I had had my first disquieting glimpse of the moonlit water. I could see them plainly, only a block away, and was horrified by the bestial abnormality of their faces and the dog-like subhumanness of their crouching gait. One man moved in a positively simian way, with long arms frequently touching the ground, while another, robed in tiarid, seemed to progress in an almost hopping fashion. I judged this party to be the one I had seen in the Gilman's courtyard, the one, therefore, most closely on my trail. As some of the figures turned to look in my direction, I was transfixed with fright, yet managed to preserve the casual, shambling gait I had assumed. To this day, I do not know whether they saw me or not. If they did, my stratagem must have deceived them, for they passed on across the moonlit space without varying their course. Meanwhile, croaking and jabbering in some hateful, guttural pattern I could not identify. Once more in shadow, I resumed my former dog trot past the leaning and decrepit houses that stared blankly into the night. Having crossed the western sidewalk, I rounded the nearest corner into Bates Street, where I kept close to the buildings on the southern side. I passed two houses showing signs of habitation, one of which had faint lights in upper rooms, yet met with no obstacle. As I turned into Adams Street, I felt measurably safer, but received a shock when a man reeled out of a black doorway directly in front of me. He proved, however, too hopelessly drunk to be a menace so that I reached the dismal ruins of the Bank Street warehouses safely. No one was stirring in that dead street beside the river gorge, and the roar of the waterfalls quite drowned my footsteps. It was a long dog trot to the ruined station, and the great brick warehouse walls around me seemed somehow more terrifying than the fronts of private houses. At last, I saw the ancient arcaded station, or what was left of it, and made directly for the tracks that started from its farther end. The rails were rusty, but mainly intact, and not more than half the ties had rotted away. Walking or running on such a surface was very difficult, but I did my best, and on the whole made a very fair time. For some distance, the line kept along the gorgeous brink, but at length I reached the long covered bridge where it crossed the chasm at a dizzying height. The condition of this bridge would determine my next step. If humanly possible, I would use it. If not, I would have to risk more street wandering and take the nearest intact highway bridge. The vast, barn-like length of the old bridge gleamed spectrally in the moonlight, and I saw that the ties were safe for at least a few feet within. Entering, I began to use my flashlight, and was almost knocked down by the cloud of bats that flapped past me. About halfway across, there was a perilous gap in the ties, which I feared for a moment would halt me. But in the end, I risked a desperate jump, which fortunately succeeded. I was glad to see the moonlight again when I emerged from that macabre tunnel. The old tracks crossed River Street at grade, and at once veered off into a region increasingly rural, and with less and less of Innsmouth's abhorrent, fishy odor. Here, the dense growth of weeds and briars hindered me and cruelly tore my clothes, but I was nonetheless glad that they were there to give me concealment in case of peril. I knew that much of my route would be visible from the rally road. Chapter 6 The marshy region began very shortly, with the single track on a low, grassy embankment where the weedy growth was somewhat thinner. 
Then came a sort of island of higher ground, where the line passed through a shallow open cut, choked with bushes and brambles. I was very glad of this partial shelter, since at this point the rally road was uncomfortably near, according to my window view. At the end of the cut, I would cross the track and swerve off to a safer distance. But meanwhile, I must be exceedingly careful. I was by this time thankfully certain that the railway itself was not patrolled. Just before entering the cut, I glanced behind me, but saw no pursuer. The ancient spires and roofs of decaying in's mouth gleamed lovely and ethereal in the magic yellow moonlight. And I thought of how they must have looked in the old days before the shadow fell. Then, as my gaze circled inland from the town, something less tranquil arrested my notice and held me immobile for a moment. What I saw, or fancied I saw, was a disturbing suggestion of undulant motion far to the south, a suggestion which made me conclude that a very large horde must be pouring out of the city along the level Ipswich Road. The distance was great, and I could distinguish nothing in detail, but I did not at all like the look of that moving column. It undulated too much and glistened too brightly in the rays of the now westering moon. There was a suggestion of sound, too, though the wind was blowing the other way. A suggestion of bestial scraping and bellowing even worse than the muttering of the parties I had lately overheard. All sorts of unpleasant conjectures crossed my mind. I thought of those very extreme Innsmouth types, said to be hidden in crumbling centuried warrens near the waterfront. I thought, too, of those nameless swimmers I had seen, counting the parties so far glimpsed, as well as those presumably covering other roads. A number of my pursuers must be strangely large for a town as depopulated as Innsmouth. Whence could come the dense personnel of such a column as I now beheld? Did those ancient, unplumbed warrants teem with a twisted, uncatalogued, and unsuspected life? Or had some unseen ship indeed landed a legion of unknown outsiders on that hellish reef? Who were they? Why were they there? And if such a column of them was scouring the Ipswich Road, would the patrols on the other roads be likewise augmented? I had entered the brush-grown cut and was struggling along at a very slow pace when that damnable fishy odor again waxed dominant. Had the wind suddenly changed eastward so that it blew in from the sea and over the town? It must have, I concluded, since I now began to hear shocking, guttural murmurs from that hitherto silent direction. There was another sound, too, a kind of wholesale, colossal flopping or pattering, which somehow called up images of the most detestable sort. It made me think illogically of that unpleasantly undulated column on the far-off Ipswich Road. And then... Both stench and sounds grew stronger, so that I paused, shivering and grateful for the cut's protection. It was here, I recalled, that the rally road drew so close to the old railway before crossing westward and diverging. Something was coming along that road, and I must lie low till its passage and vanishment in the distance. Thank heaven these creatures employed no dogs for tracking, though perhaps that would have been impossible amidst the omnipresent regional odor. Crouched in the bushes of that sandy cleft, I felt reasonably safe, even though I knew the searchers 
would have to cross the track in front of me, not more than a hundred yards away. I would be able to see them, but they could not, except by a malign miracle, see me. All at once, I began dreading to look at them as they passed. I saw the close, moonlit space where they would surge by, and had curious thoughts about the irredeemable pollution of that space. They would perhaps be the worst of all in's mouth types, something no one would care to remember. The stench waxed overpowering, and the noises swelled to a bestial babble of croaking, baying, and barking, without the least suggestion of human speech. Were these indeed the voices of my pursuers? Did they have dogs, after all? So far, I had seen none of the lower animals in Innsmouth. That flopping or puttering was monstrous. I could not look upon the degenerate creatures responsible for it. I would keep my eyes shut till the sounds receded toward the west. The horde was very close now. The air foul with their hoarse snarlings, and the ground almost shaking with their alien rhythmed footfalls. My breath nearly ceased to come, and I put every ounce of willpower into the task of holding my eyelids down. I am not even yet willing to say whether what followed was a hideous actuality or only a nightmare hallucination. The latter action of the government, after my frantic appeals, would tend to confirm it as a monstrous truth, but could not. The hallucination have been repeated under the quasi-hypnotic spell of that ancient, haunted, and shadowed town. Such places have strange properties, and the legacy of insane legend might well have acted on more than one human imagination amidst those dead, stench-cursed streets and huddles of rotting roofs and crumbling steeples. It is not possible that the germ of an actual contagious madness lurks in the depths of that shadow over Innsmouth. Who can be sure of reality? Where does madness leave off and reality begin? Is it possible that even my latest fear is sheer delusion? But I must try to tell you what I thought I saw that night under the mocking yellow moon. I saw surging and hopping down the rally road in plain sight in front of me as I crouched among the wild brambles of that desolate railway cut. Of course, my resolution to keep my eyes shut had failed. It was foredoomed to failure, for who could crouch blindly while a legion of croaking, baying entities of unknown source flopped noisomely past? scarcely more than a hundred yards away. I thought I was prepared for the worst, and I really ought to have been prepared considering what I had seen before. My other pursuers had been accursedly abnormal, so should I not have been ready to face a strengthening of the abnormal element, to look upon forms in which there was no mixture of the normal at all. I did not open my eyes until the raucous clamor came loudly from a point obviously straight ahead. Then I knew that a long section of them must be plainly in sight, where the sides of the cut flattened out, and the road crossed the track. And I could no longer keep myself from sampling whatever horror that leering yellow moon might have to show. It was the end for whatever remains to me of life on the surface of this earth, of every vestige of mental peace and confidence in the integrity of nature and of the human mind. Nothing that I could have imagined, nothing even that I could have gathered had I credited old Zadok's crazy tale in the most literal way. 
would be in any way comparable to the demonic, blasphemous reality that I saw, or believe I saw. I have tried to hint what it was in order to postpone the horror of writing it down badly. Can it be possible that this planet has actually spawned such things that human eyes have truly seen as objective flesh? What man has hitherto known only in febrile fantasy and tenuous legend? And yet, I saw them in a limitless stream, flopping, hopping, croaking, bleating, surging inhumanely through the spectral moonlight in a grotesque, malignant saraband of fantastic nightmare. And some of them had tall tiaras of that nameless whitish gold metal, and some were strangely robed, and one who led the way was clad in a ghoulishly humped black coat and striped trousers, and had a man's felt hat perched on the shapeless thing that answered for a head. I think their predominant color was a grayish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly. Their forms vaguely suggested the anthropoid, while their heads were the heads of fish, with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. At the sides of their necks were palpitating gills, and their long paws were webbed. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs, and sometimes on four. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices, clearly used for articulate speech, held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. But for all of their monstrousness, they were not unfamiliar to me. I knew too well what they must be, for was not the memory of that evil tiara at Newburyport still fresh? They were the blasphemous fish frogs of the nameless design, living and horrible. And as I saw them, I knew also of what that humped, tiaraed priest in the black church basement had so fearsomely reminded me. Their number was past guessing. It seemed to me that there were limitless swarms of them, and certainly my momentary glimpse could have shown only the least fraction. In another instant, everything was blotted out by a merciful fit of fainting, the first I had ever had. It was a gentle daylight rain that awakened me from my stupor in the brush-grown railway cut. And when I staggered out to the roadway, I saw no trace of any prints in the fresh mud. The fishy odor, too, was gone. Innsmouth ruined roofs and toppling steeples loomed up grayly towards the southeast. But not a living creature did I spy in all the desolate salt marshes around. My watch was still going and told me that the hour was past noon. The reality of what I had been through was highly uncertain in my mind, but I felt that something hideous lay in the background. I must get away from the evil shadowed in mouth, and accordingly, I began to test my cramped, wearied powers of locomotion. Despite weakness, hunger, horror, and bewilderment, I found myself, after a long time, able to walk so I slowly started along the muddy road to Rowley. Before evening, I was in the village, getting a meal and providing myself with presentable clothes. I caught the night train to Arkham, and the next day talked long and earnestly with government officials there, a process I later repeated in Boston. With the main result of these colloquies, the public is now familiar, and I wish... For normality's sake, 
that there was nothing more to tell. Perhaps it is madness that is overtaking me, yet perhaps a great horror or a greater marvel is reaching out. As may well have been imagined, I gave up most of the foreplanned features of the rest of my tour. The scenic, architectural, and antiquarian diversions on which I had counted so heavily. Nor did I dare look for that piece of strange jewelry said to be in the Miskatonic University Museum. I did, however, improve my stay in Arkham by collecting some genealogical notes I had long wished to process. Very rough and hasty data, it is true, but capable of good use later on when I might have time to collate and codify them. A curator of the historical society there, Mr. E. Lapham Peabody, was very courteous about assisting me and expressed unusual interest when I told him I was the grandson of Eliza Ornay of Arkham, who was born in 1867 and had married James Williamson of Ohio at the age of 17. It seemed that a maternal uncle of mine had been there many years before on a quest much like my own, and that my grandfather's family was a topic of some local curiosity. There had, Mr. Peabody said, been considerable discussion about the marriage of her father, Benjamin Orney, just after the Civil War, since the ancestry of the bride was peculiarly puzzling. That bride was understood to have been an orphaned Marsh of New Hampshire, a cousin of the Essex County Marshes, but her education had been in France and she knew very little of her family. A guardian had deposited funds in a Boston bank to maintain her and her French governess, but that guardian's name was unfamiliar to Arkham people, and in time, he dropped out of sight so that the governess assumed his role by court appointment. The French woman, now long dead, was very taciturn, and there were those who said she could have told him more than she did. But the most baffling thing was the inability of anyone to place the recorded parents of the young woman, Enoch and Lydia, Missouri Marsh, among the known families of New Hampshire. Possibly, many suggested, she was the natural daughter of some Marsh of prominence. She certainly had the true Marsh eyes. Most of the puzzling was done after her early death, which took place at birth of my grandmother, her only child. Having formed some disagreeable impressions connected with the name Marsh, I did not welcome the news that it belonged on my own ancestral tree, nor was I pleased by Mr. Peabody's suggestion that I had the true eyes of Marsh myself. However, I was grateful for data, which I knew would prove valuable, and I took copious notes and lists of book references regarding the well-documented Orne family. I went directly home to Toledo from Boston, and later spent a month at Maumee recuperating from my ordeal. In September, I entered Oberlin for my final year, and from then, till the next June was busy with studies and other wholesome activities. Reminded of the bygone terror only by the occasional official visits from government men in connection with the campaign which my pleas and evidence had started. Around the middle of July, just a year after the Innsmouth experience, I spent a week with my late mother's family in Cleveland checking some of my new genealogical data with the various notes, traditions, and bits of heirloom material in existence there, and seeing what kind of connected chart I could construct. I did not exactly relish the task, for the atmosphere of the Williamson home had always depressed me. There was a strain of morbidity there, and my mother had never encouraged my visiting her parents as a child, although she always welcomed her father 
when he came to Toledo. My Arkham-born grandmother had seemed strange and almost terrifying to me, and I do not think I grieved when she disappeared. I was eight years old, and it was said that she wandered off in grief after the suicide of my uncle Douglas, her eldest son. He had shot himself after a trip to New England, the same trip, no doubt, which had caused him to be recalled at the Arkham Historical Society. This uncle had resembled her, and I never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them had given me a vague, unaccountable uneasiness. My mother and uncle Walter had not looked like that. They were like their father, though poor little cousin Lawrence, Walter's son, had been an almost perfect duplicate of his grandmother before his condition took him to the permanent seclusion of a sanatorium at Canton. I had not seen him in four years, but my uncle once implied that his state, both mental and physical, was very bad. This worry had probably been a major cause of his mother's death two years before. My grandfather and his widowed son Walter now comprised the Cleveland household, but the memory of older times hung thickly over it. I still disliked the place and tried to get my researches done as quickly as possible. Williamson records and traditions were supplied in abundance by my grandfather, though for ornate material, I had to depend on my uncle Walter who put at my disposal the contents of all his files, including notes, letters, cuttings, heirlooms, photographs, and miniatures. It was in going over the letters and pictures on the orne side, but I began to acquire a kind of terror of my own ancestry. As I have said, my grandmother and Uncle Douglas had always disturbed me. Now... Years after their passing, I gazed at their pictured faces with a measurably heightened feeling of repulsion and alienation. I could not at first understand the change, but gradually a horrible sort of comparison began to obtrude itself on my unconscious mind, despite the steady refusal of my consciousness to admit even the least suspicion of it. It was clear that the typical expression of these faces now suggested something it had not suggested before, something which would bring stark panic if too openly thought of. But the worst shock came when my uncle showed me the ornate jewelry in a downtown safe deposit vault. Some of the items were delicate and inspiring enough, but there was one box of strange old pieces descended from my mysterious great-grandmother, which my uncle was almost reluctant to produce. They were, he said, of very grotesque and almost repulsive design, and had never to his knowledge been publicly worn, though my grandmother used to enjoy looking at them. Vague legends of bad luck clustered around them, and my great-grandmother's French governess had said that they ought not to be worn in New England, though it would be quite safe to wear them in Europe. As my uncle began slowly and grudgingly to unwrap the things he urged me not to be shocked by the strangeness and frequent hideousness of the designs, artists and archaeologists who had seen them pronounced the worksmanship superlatively and exotically exquisite, though no one seemed able to define their exact material or assign them to any specific art tradition. There were two armlets, a tiara, and a kind of pectoral, the latter having in high relief certain figures of almost unbearable extravagance. During this description, I had kept a tight rein on my emotions, but my face must have betrayed my mounting fears. My uncle looked concerned and 
paused in his unwrapping to study my countenance. I motioned to him to continue, which he did with renewed signs of reluctance. He seemed to expect some demonstration from the first piece. The tiara became visible, but I doubt if he expected quite what actually happened. I did not expect it either, for I thought I was thoroughly forewarned regarding what jewelry would turn out to be. What I did was to faint silently away, just as I had done in that briar choked railway cut a year before. From that day on, my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension, nor do I know how much is hideous truth and how much madness. My great-grandmother had been a marsh of unknown source whose husband lived in Arkham. And did not old Zadok say that the daughter of Obed Marsh by a monstrous mother was married to an Arkham man through a trick? Was it that the ancient topper had muttered about the likeness of my eyes to Captain Obed's in Arkham too? The curator had told me I had the true Marsh eyes. Was Obed Marsh my own great-great-grandfather? Who or what then? was a great-great-grandmother. But perhaps this is all madness. Those whitish gold ornaments might easily have been brought over from some Innsmouth sailor by the father of my great-grandmother, whoever he was. And that look in the staring-eyed faces of my grandmother and self-slain uncle might be sheer fancy on my part. Sheer fancy bolstered up by the Innsmouth shadow, which had so darkly colored my imagination. But why had my uncle killed himself after an ancestral quest in New England? For more than two years, I fought off these reflections with partial success. My father secured me a place of employment, and I buried myself in routine as deeply as possible. In the winter of 1930, to 1931, however, the dreams began. They were very sparse and insidious at first, but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great watery spaces opened up out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean walls with grotesque fishes as my companions. Then, the other shapes began to appear, filling me with nameless horror at the moment I awoke. But during the dreams, they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them, wearing their unhuman trappings, treading their aqueous ways, and praying monstrously at their evil sea-bottom temples. There was much more than I could remember. But even what I did remember each morning would be enough to stamp me as a madman or a genius if I ever dared write it down. Some frightful influence I felt was seeking gradually to drag me out of the sane world of wholesome life into unnameable abysses of blackness and alienage. And the process told heavily on me. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd, nervous affliction had me in its grip, and I found myself at times almost unable to shut my eyes. It was then that I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case, there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began looking at me curiously and almost with fright. What was taking place in me? Could it be that I was coming to resemble my grandmother and Uncle Douglas? One night, I had a frightful dream, 
in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace of many terraces, with gardens of strange leprous corals and grotesque brachiate effervescences, and welcomed me with a warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed as those who take to the water change, and told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead son had learned about, and had leaped to a realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm too. I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. I also met that which had been her grandmother. For eighty thousand years, Bithyal Yi had lived in Yihan Fli, and thither she had gone back after Obed Marsh was dead. Yihan Fli was not destroyed when the upper earth men shot death into the sea. It was hurt, but not destroyed. The Deep Ones could never be destroyed, even though the Peleiogen magic of the Forgotten Old Ones might sometimes check them. For the present, they would rest. But someday, if they remembered, they would rise again for the tribute Great Cthulhu craved. It would be a city greater than Innsmouth next time. They had planned to spread, and brought up that which would help them. But now they must wait once more, for bringing the Upper Earth's men's death. I must do a penance, but that would not be heavy. This was the dream in which I saw Shoggoth for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning, the mirror definitely told me that I had acquired the Innsmouth luck. So far, I have not shot myself as my Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step. A certain dreams deterred me. The tense extremes of horror are lessening, and I feel strangely drawn toward the unknown sea deeps instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in sleep and awake with a kind of exultation instead of terror. I do not believe I need wait for the full change, as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium, as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard of splendors await me, and I shall see them soon. I spoke the call to Cthulhu again. And again, no, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from that Canton madhouse, and together we shall go to Marble Shadowed In's mouth. We shall swim out to the brooding reef in the sea, and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopean and many columned Ehon Flea. And in that lair of the Deep Ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. <laughs>